What's up, YouTube? It's your boy GP on the keys, and it's too easy. We're back with another video today. We have. I said. Them, I said. I said we were going. We were going to wait till Saturday to put it out. Forget it. You know what I'm saying? Content, content over everything. So we got Napoleon defeated Ashburn 1809. Napoleon suffers his first defeat at war. This, this, this is a very monumental day. Let's let's go. Let's go. TV History March collaboration. Supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In 1809, France, under Napoleon Bonaparte, was the most powerful nation in Europe. But the French Emperor's invasion of Spain and Portugal the previous year had failed to deliver the easy victory he'd expected. And with many of Napoleon's best troops and commanders now tied down in Spain, an old enemy prepared to challenge France once more. Yo, that's crazy how he was able to take Austria and Russia the first time. Like, and Russia is huge compared to all his countries. But then he had a problem with Spain and Portugal. I mean, obviously, Britain, Britain helped him. But still, like, these countries are... are, are tiny compared to the other countries like spain and, and Aust in the austrian empire are basically the same size and you got russia is like the biggest country in europe at this point like you know what I'm saying just that's war anything can happen in war Austria had been preparing for war with France since her last humiliating defeat at Austerlitz in 1805. Now, with Napoleon busy in Spain and a British promise of cash subsidies, plus a supporting attack in Northern Europe, it looked like the ideal time to strike. This time, Austria's armies would be led by Archduke Charles, Emperor Francis's younger brother. At 37, he was two years younger than Napoleon, but already had 15 years' experience of high command. Mm. And he was learning from past defeats. He'd begun to reform the Austrian army along French lines, copying Napoleon's core system and introducing new infantry tactics. See, the enemy, the enemy, you know what I'm saying? You, everything is, nothing is new under the sun. The enemies are going to copy you when they see you doing good. That's how it is, man. When you start doing good, people start copying your moves. In the Napoleonic Wars, infantry fought in I, 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 I was gonna, I was gonna read, there was a video about the war tactics in the playlist, but I just didn't do it. Because it's just like, I feel like it wouldn't be, I feel like if you want a video, I would give you a video of a battle. So, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm done pausing for a minute, so. Close order. Packed together, standing shoulder to shoulder. But why present such an easy target for the enemy? Exactly. First, command and control. Before radios, orders had to be relayed by shouted commands, drums or bugles. Difficult enough in the smoke and din of battle. Almost impossible if troops were scattered. Second, firepower. Smoothbore muskets were inaccurate beyond about 80 yards, so volley fire, firing en masse, was the best way to inflict physical and psychological damage on the enemy. True, true. Third, morale. Soldiers were much more willing to advance into danger or hold the line if they did so together as a unit, urging each other on. I see. Fourth, defense against cavalry. Scattered infantry were easy targets for horsemen. Only by sticking together, could they fight them off? The basic tactical unit of infantry was the battalion. A French line battalion had, in theory, 840 men, but in practice, nearer five to 600. Our example here has 605 men, a typical strength for a battalion on campaign. The men were divided into six companies, four fusilier companies and two flank companies. On the right, the grenadiers, made up of the tallest, strongest men, often detached to form elite all-grenadier units. And on the left, the voltigeurs, specialist light infantry used for skirmishing in front of the battalion. Skirmishers moved independently, used cover, and fired at will to harass and unsettle the enemy. 
mm. while preventing enemy skirmishers carrying out the same task. So they're, so, so they're basically like scout troops, like the scout troops. Like you stay, like you basically, they're like you just, you just run and just, it's, you're like a, you're like a, a decoy, not not a decoy, but like a distraction for the enemy. Like you're basically softening them up so the other forces can go in. I see, I see how it is. I like that. Like I like that. Most armies also had specialist light infantry units for this role, such as the British 95th Rifles, French Chasseurs à Pied, and Austrian and Prussian Jäger Battalions. The traditional battlefield formation was the line. All companies formed up alongside each other, three ranks deep. Line formation maximized the number of men who could fire their muskets at the enemy, and limited casualties from artillery fire. But it was extremely vulnerable to cavalry if it could be outflanked. And even for well-drilled troops, it was difficult to keep the line straight while advancing across broken ground. So for maneuver and attack, battalions usually formed a column of divisions. This was a more flexible formation that allowed the battalion to advance quickly though it presented a larger target to enemy guns, firing solid round shot that would tear through several ranks, and far fewer men could fire their muskets at the enemy. Theoretically, therefore, the battalion would deploy into line before reaching the enemy. But carrying out this slow maneuver under fire wasn't always possible or sensible. So some commanders kept their men in column relying on momentum to break the enemy line. This was a risky tactic that often worked against raw troops, but led to high casualties when facing better trained infantry, like British redcoats. A column could be closed up quickly to provide protection from cavalry, or if there was time, could form a square. With bayonets fixed, the battalion formed an all-round defense that often resembled more of a rectangle. Mm, I like that. Enemy cavalry could surround the battalion, but not break in, as horses won't charge a solid wall of men and steel. But an infantry square was extremely vulnerable to artillery fire, and could only move very slowly. Changing quickly and smoothly from one formation to another, especially under fire, required training, practice, and experience. In 1809, the Austrian army began to use the battalion mass formation, crude but more suited to hastily trained conscripts. This was a dense column with limited firepower and huge vulnerability to enemy cannon. But it could quickly close up to repel cavalry using the same principle as the square, but without the complex drill, and was much more maneuverable. Napoleon, warned by his spies that Austria was preparing for war, left Spain and raced back to Paris, arriving on the 24th of January, 1809. The French army in Germany, commanded by Marshal Berthier, would need urgent reinforcement. So Napoleon summoned units from Spain, called up young conscripts, and soldiers from his German allies in the Confederation of the Rhine. La Grande Armée was no longer the finely honed instrument of 1805. That's crazy how like France and Germany would like alternate between being enemies and being allies. Because we, you know, in like World War One and World War Two, Germany was enemies with France. Like they, they just alternate. Like well, how, how about a uh, hundred and thirty some years? A hundred years can change a lot, I guess. Hmm. But with Napoleon at its head it was still a formidable force. Archduke Charles ordered diversionary attacks in Poland and northern Italy, but launched his main attack against France's ally, Bavaria, on the 10th of April. It came a week earlier than Napoleon had expected and caught the French emperor by surprise. Oh, man. Charles oh, man. was relying on a rapid advance, but a last-minute change of plans, torrential rain, and a slow-moving baggage train slowed progress to a crawl. Marshal Berthier was a brilliant chief of staff to Napoleon, but an indecisive field commander. 
His forces were too widely dispersed, and Marshal Davout's Third Corps was dangerously isolated at Regensburg. Charles ordered his corps to converge and destroy it. Mm. But on the 17th of April, Napoleon arrived at Donauwert to take over command. He immediately ordered Davout to withdraw from his exposed position. It was too late for him to escape without a fight. Davout's Third Corps was one of the best in the Grande Armée, and in a fast-moving battle across wooded hills, the heroes of Auerstadt threw back the Austrians. Despite the heroism of General Major Liechtenstein, badly wounded, leading his troops forward, Third Corps escaped the encirclement. The Battle of Teugenhausen was the start of Napoleon's so-called four-day campaign. First, he used Marshal Lefebvre's Bavarian 7th Corps and a provisional corps under Marshal Lann to drive a wedge into the Austrian army. Then he pursued its left wing towards Landshut. See, I, I, like, I like the strategy he does when he breaks, he breaks the army down into little sections. You know what I'm saying? That, that's, that's so, like, like, just, like, the genius that, like, the genius of that, like, you basically, you're breaking apart the enemy army into multiple sections and then you can you can attack one at a time you don't have to face the whole entire force of one army and plus it destroys morale because you, you see it, you see you see your people over there getting destroyed and you're like oh my god like how can i really i can't even really fight now i don't even really feel like fighting because my, my 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 fellow my fellow soldiers are getting destroyed like that that that's a good way to break up the enemy like divide like divide your enemy like basically take away your firepower it takes away their firepower because that's three whole that's three whole cores and a reserve that, that, that that's that's a lot of firepower they needed believing he was following the main austrian army french troops and their german allies stormed the town's bridge to win a hard-fought victory but napoleon realized that archduke charles was not at landshut and that once again he'd left marshal davou to face the main enemy force Sending Marshal Bessier in pursuit of the Austrian left wing, Napoleon swung north, falling on the Austrian 4th Corps at Eckmühl. The French and their German allies won their fourth victory in as many days. But Charles's main force was still intact, and hoping to keep it so, he ordered a rapid retreat across the Danube. The French pursued storming the walled city of Regensburg, which they knew as Ratisbon, with its vital stone bridge. Napoleon put Marshal Lann in charge of the assault. When the attack faltered, Lann threatened to lead the next charge in person, and his men, suitably chastised, took the city. During the siege, Napoleon was hit in the foot by a spent bullet, causing widespread alarm, but it proved to be a superficial wound. Hmm. Stubborn Austrian resistance had allowed Archduke Charles and his army to escape across the Danube. Napoleon had cut the Austrian army in half, but both sections now retreated in good order towards Vienna. Napoleon led his forces in pursuit, detaching Lefebvre's Bavarian Corps to deal with a popular revolt in Tyrol, and Third Corps and the Württemberg Eighth Corps to guard his line of communications. Charles chose not to defend the capital, which surrendered on the 13th of May after a short bombardment. Instead, Charles and the Austrian army lay in wait across the Danube. Napoleon was now down to 80,000 men, facing 110,000 Austrians. Oh, I see what it is. Like, you, you, you're just going to wait and let Napoleon just lose more and more men. Just let him lose, let him keep losing men. And then by the time he comes, he's gonna be severely outgunned and overpowered. Like that, that makes, you know what I'm saying? I like, I like that, Charles, I like that. that. That's a smart idea, Charles. Very smart idea. Charles's army had fought bravely and well throughout the campaign. But Napoleon still had a low opinion of Austrian troops and decided to attack. To cannon, all men are equal. That's true. That's true. Cannon don't got your name on it. On 
on the night of the 20th of May, French engineers hastily built a series of floating bridges between the river islands of the Danube. And French troops began to cross. By noon the next day, Napoleon had most of Massena's 4th Corps and his cavalry across the river. About 24,000 men and 40 guns, holding the villages of Aspern and Essling. Napoleon expected the Austrians to retreat once more, and that he'd only face a rear guard. But reports soon arrived that the entire Austrian army was advancing against him in five attack columns, 90,000 men and 300 cannon. Ooh. The situation got even worse. Ooh. The Austrians began to float heavy barges and obstacles downriver to smash through the flimsy French bridge. Each time, Napoleon's only supply route was cut off for several hours, causing critical delays to the arrival of reinforcements and ammunition. Yo, that, yo. Yo, that's crazy. Like that calculation is crazy. Like them, those spot. I know it had to be some Austrian, some Austrian spies to see that. Like that's a that that strategy is ridiculous. Like you basically you cut off the supplies, and you you make them so they can't come on time, so you can just keep attacking them while they're de while they're waiting on supplies. You catch them with no ammo, and bro, that's that's you know you got you got to give it up, man. Like you got to give it up, and you got to give credit where credit is due, because that is a very smart. Like, all big shout out to the Austrian general, because that, that's a smart idea, you know what I'm saying? That's so, that's so, that's so smart. Like. The battle began around 2.45 p.m. as infantry of the Austrian first column attacked Aspern. The village was soon under attack from three sides. General Molitor's French garrison clung on desperately, fighting hand-to-hand -hand in the streets and suffering 50% casualties. Mm. To support the defenders of Aspern, Napoleon ordered cavalry to charge the Austrian third column. But they could not break through the Austrian infantry, closed up in their battalion mass formation. At 6 p.m., Archduke Charles ordered General Bellegarde's second column to take Aspern at any cost. Charles himself rode among the front ranks, urging the men forward. In ferocious fighting, the Austrians took the village. Napoleon immediately sent in newly arrived reinforcements to recapture it. About the same time, the Austrian 4th Column began its attack on the village of Essling, where Marshal Lann had taken charge of defences while he waited for his own corps to cross the Danube. The first Austrian assault was repulsed. The veteran French cavalry commander, General Despagne, led his cuirassiers in pursuit, but was hit by grape shot and died of his wounds. Around 9 p.m., the Austrian 5th Column finally arrived in position and made its first attack against Essling, which was thrown back by Land's troops. As night fell, firing died out across the battlefield, and men got what rest they could among the dead and the wounded. That's crazy, though. You think that they 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 basically they basically take a break in in the middle of a battle and then come back tomorrow, like that's I know it's like I know it's like kind of weird, kind of crazy. But let's just think about it. You've been fighting somebody all day, then you know what? Hey, time to go to sleep. Then we up up and at it tomorrow. Let's fight again. Like, how do you think about that as a soldier? Like knowing you 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 survived today. You almost died today. You had you saw a can a, a little musket ball gla graze past your ear. You all you heard is vroom, 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 just musket balls past your ear, and you see you see a couple of your dudes, a couple of your soldiers fall and die. You see some cavalry men get destroyed. You see somebody get stabbed with a bayonet. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're seeing all this stuff in your eyes. Then you got then I know you can't sleep that night because you probably got 
PTSD from that. And then you got to come back up the next morning and do it again. Wow. Like I said, I commend everyone who fights in the army, any type of army service. Because you are a lot better than me in that regard. Because man, man, man. Overnight, 2nd Corps and the Imperial Guard crossed the Danube to reinforce Napoleon's army, which now numbered 71,000 and 150 guns. That's, what, that's all we needed. But then the bridge broke again, leaving Davout's 3rd Corps still waiting to cross. Nevertheless, Napoleon decided to attack, using 2nd Corps to break the Austrian center. <laughs> you can't wait! But first, Aspern would have to be retaken. Heavy fighting broke out in the village before dawn. By 7 a.m., it was back in French hands. At Essling, fresh Austrian attacks were fought off by General Lasalle's cavalry and units of the Young Guard. With both flanks secure, Napoleon launched his main attack in the center with Land's Second Corps. Austrian guns poured fire into the advancing French ranks. General Saint-Hilaire, leading the attack, a hero of Austerlitz and Jena, had his foot blown off, a wound that proved fatal. Because you know back then, and then you know back then the medical surgery was crazy, either, either they're going to cut your leg off or you're just going to die from infection. But bro, that's, oh, I can't even imagine, oh, getting your leg blown off. Archduke Charles sent his grenadier reserve forward to strengthen the line. The French infantry, under torrential fire, began to fall back. At this critical moment, the French bridge over the Danube was broken again, halting the vital flow of reinforcements and ammunition to Napoleon's army. By 2 p.m., the French had been driven out of Aspern once more. Heavy fighting continued in Essling, which was briefly captured by the Austrians, then retaken by the Young Guard. Napoleon knew his army could do no more. At 4 p.m., he ordered his exhausted cavalry to make a last charge to keep the enemy at bay, then gave the order to retreat. Ooh. Archduke Charles, whose own army had suffered huge losses and was low on ammunition, was content to watch the French withdraw to the island of Lobau. In the final moments of the battle, Marshal Lann, one of Napoleon's finest commanders and closest friends, was hit by a cannonball that smashed both his legs. He died of his wounds a week later. It was a deep blow to the Emperor. The two-day Battle of aspern essling was Napoleon's first major defeat, caused by his overconfidence and hasty planning. Both sides suffered heavy losses, and Napoleon avoided a much greater disaster only because of the exhaustion of the Austrian army. The French Emperor had learned new respect for the Austrians. Under Archduke Charles, they had fought bravely, with greater confidence, organization and leadership. Within days of his defeat, Napoleon had summoned reinforcements to join him on the Danube and begun planning his revenge. If you'd like to learn more about you know it, that's why you can't, you can never underestimate your enemy, man. You can never underestimate who you're going against because like, like Napoleon did, he underestimated them and he, they got smacked. They got smacked by the Austrians. You can't, you can never underestimate. Under, you can never underestimate your enemy. I'm sorry, my stuttering. I, I, you, you've seen it before. I have a stutter, and, it's, and I hate it, but that's just how it is. But anyway, thank you again for watching. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you are new to the channel. Do not forget to hit that subscribe button. Do not forget to hit that share button. Do not forget to hit that notification bell. Also, thank you again. Be safe. Have a great day. Stay on the grind. I'm out. Peace.